This is part three of the three-part series on Timoshenko beam theory. If you have not watched parts one and two, you should stop this video and watch those first. In this video, I'll find the equations of motion, and I will also provide a complete review on all three parts of this series. So we have the external work, we have the kinetic energy or the variation of the kinetic energy and of the strain energy. The next thing to do is to substitute all of this into Hamilton's principle. So it's equation 17, 24, and 25 need to be substituted into Hamilton's principle, which is equation 9. And that gives us the, the integral from t1 to t2 of del t minus del u plus del w e dt is equal to the integral from t1 to t2, the integral from 0 to l, and now I'm going to go back to my expressions, and I'm just going to pick off everything that's under the integral sign. It's either going to multiply del W, or it's going to multiply del Psi. So del W or del Psi. Same thing in the case of our strain energy. Del Psi, del W, and del Psi. From our strain energy, we get these two components multiplying del Psi and one multiplying del W. That's in blue. In green, we get one component multiplying del W and then something multiplying del Psi. This is ignoring our boundary terms for now. And the same thing here, something times del W. If I group that as everything multiplied by del W, I get minus MW dot, all dotted, plus KGA times W comma X minus Psi, all comma x plus f. Of course, f multiplies del w. So all of these multiply del w. And then separately, I'm going to group everything that multiplies del psi. In the case of the kinetic energy, it is minus j psi dot, the whole quantity is dotted, plus ei psi comma x, the whole quantity has an x derivative, plus kga w comma x minus psi, and all of that is multiplied by del psi. We can close our square brackets, dx dt. Plus, and now I'm going to include the boundary terms. So there are no boundary terms from here, from the external work. We mentioned there are no boundary terms that survive from the kinetic energy due to the fundamental assumption made with Hamilton's principle. So the only boundary terms come from the strain energy. And those are, the first boundary term is the one that multiplies del psi, and that is ei psi comma x del psi at zero and l. And the second boundary term is that that multiplies del w. So kga times w comma x minus psi del w at zero and l. And all of that must be equal to zero. Equation 25. Now guys, believe it or not, we're done. It's just a question of addressing each of these components separately. You may recall we've discussed previously that in order to satisfy Hamilton's principle, each of these integrals and each of these boundary terms must go to zero independently. So because del W is arbitrary, this is the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations. Because del W is arbitrary, therefore everything multiplying del W must be zero at every point in the domain. Let me also mention again what I mentioned before, that the functional is a function of two variables, or two dependent variables. It's a function of x and time as well. As a result, we get two equations of motion, and we get separate boundary conditions for each psi and w. That's a lot of speaking. Let's put this into a mathematical form. And so let's state our equations of motion and boundary conditions explicitly. Okay, so again, the equations of motion are that this is zero and that this is zero. I'm just going to write that on the next page. Equations of motion, we get that minus mw dot, all dotted, plus kga w comma x minus psi, all comma x plus f is equal to zero. That's our first equation of motion. And our second one is minus j psi dot, all dotted, plus e i psi comma x, all comma x, plus k g a times w comma x minus psi is equal to zero. Okay, now just to write it in a form that's easier to look at, I'm going to get rid of these giant dots and, and this comma x here. 
And I'm also going to multiply each of these equations by minus 1 on both sides. So I'm going to flip the signs of each term. And what we get is that the time derivative of mw dot minus the derivative with respect to x of kga times w comma x minus psi, flip the sign, minus f is equal to 0. And for the second equation, the time derivative of j psi dot minus d by dx of ei psi comma x minus kga times w comma x minus psi is equal to zero. You give them some numbers, 28 and 29, and these are our equations of motion. Again, this is in its most generalized form because I haven't yet made any assumptions as to m or j or ei or the area being constant. I'm going to do that in a minute, but before I get there, I just want to derive some moment and shear expressions consistent with what we did for the Euler-Bernoulli beam, and also just to illustrate something about the equations of motion. I think this will help to give a little bit more understanding. In the case of the moment, we can find the moment by taking the integral over the area of the normal stresses, sigma xx, times the moment arm about the y-axis, which is just z, dA. This is equal to the integral of a of minus e times times the strain. So minus e times psi comma x times z. You might recall the strain exx was just negative of psi comma x times z. Because we have another z here, that will give us z squared dA. When I integrate z squared over the area, I get the second moment of area i. So minus ei times psi comma x. Remember, in the case of the Euler-Bernoulli beam, it was minus ei w comma xx. But in that case, psi, the bending angle, was exactly equal to w comma x, the slope of the center line. Let's give that a number and put a box around it for later. We can do a similar thing with the shear in order to find the shear force v. That would be the integral over the cross-sectional area of the beam of the shear stress sigma xz dA. And with our assumption that the shear strain is constant over the cross-sectional area of the beam, we know that this is just equal to sigma xz times the area A. Sigma xz is the shear stress. We know that is equal to k, the shear correction factor, times g times gamma. So kga gamma. Equation 31, yellow box for later. If you look at what I've done a little more closely, you'll notice, look at this part of the equation. KGA times W comma X minus Psi. Well, what is W comma X minus Psi? W comma X is the slope of the center line or the angle of the center line minus the bending angle. That's just the shear angle. So this quantity is in fact the shear force. And it appears there as well. On the other hand, this quantity here is just the moment. So by substituting 30 and 31 into 28 and 29, Let's just do that on the next page. 30 and 31 into 28 and 29 allows me to rewrite these equations of motion upon making the substitution as v comma x plus f is equal to d by dt of mw dot. And the second equation becomes minus m comma x, the derivative of m with respect to x, plus v is equal to the time derivative of j psi dot. Let's number them 32 and 33, and a big red box around that. That is a final result. That is an alternative way of writing these equations of motion in terms of the moment and the shear. The first equation, you can see this is a force per unit length. We know that. It's saying that this force, the derivative of the shear plus the distributed load, is equal to the time rate of change of the momentum of the beam, mw dot. Similarly, the negative derivative of the moment with respect to x plus the shear is equal to the time rate of change of the angular momentum. So not so complicated if you think of it that way, right? And now we can go ahead and write out the boundary conditions. Going back to our equation, setting these two equal to zero will give us our two sets of boundary conditions. The first is ei psi comma x del psi at zero and L is equal to zero. 
And the second one is that KGA times W comma X minus Psi del W at zero and L is equal to zero. Numbers 34 and 35. Okay, so let's look at 34 first. This means that at zero and at L, either M is equal to zero, this we know is the moment. So either the moment is equal to zero, which means that psi comma x is equal to zero, or psi must be known, psi is specified, which means that del psi is equal to zero. At x equals zero and at x equals L, one of these two conditions must be true. Similarly, looking at equation 35, at x equals zero or L, either V is equal to zero, remember this is the shear V, which in turn means that the shear angle is zero, or simply that the angle of the center line of the beam is equal to the bending angle, or W is specified, which means that del W is zero. Let's give these numbers 36 and 37, and these are the boundary conditions. That at each of the boundaries, either the moment or the shear must be zero, or alternatively, there must be a geometric condition so that psi or w is specified. Okay, so these are the equations of motion in their most general form. And now finally, we are going to apply our assumption of a homogeneous isotropic prismatic beam. So we'll turn the page for that. So for a uniform beam, and I'm gonna rewrite equations 29 and 30 so that we have them to look at. So now we are gonna assume constant material properties, m, j, KGA, EI, etc. And then the equations of motions become M. We take M out as a constant. And then the time derivative of W dot is just W double dot minus KGA W comma XX minus Psi comma X. And the rest of that first equation remains the same. Similarly, in the second equation, we assume that J is constant. So the time derivative is simply on the side dot, giving us Psi double dot minus, assuming a constant EI, the X derivative will just apply on the Psi comma X and we get Psi comma XX, and then the rest of that remains the same. What are we up to number 38 and 39? Big red box around that. Those are the equations of motion for a uniform Timoshenko beam. We have two equations of motion to solve for our two unknowns, W and Psi. And applying the uniform beam condition, we can also simplify the boundary conditions, which becomes at x equals zero and at L, either psi comma x is equal to zero, or psi is specified. And the second boundary condition becomes that either w comma x minus psi is equal to zero. I remind you that's the shear angle. So either the shear angle is equal to zero, or w is specified. These are 40 and 41, and red boxes around that. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you how to do in the remaining time is to take these two equations and using substitution to get rid of the psi and write a single equation only in terms of w and its derivatives. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take equation 39, and I'm gonna differentiate it with respect to x. So if you think about it, I'll get a comma x here, I'll get another x here, and I'll get a comma x here. That's all I'm gonna do in the next page to begin. Turning the page, if I take the derivative with respect to x of equation 39, I get exactly what I showed you, j psi double dot comma x minus ei psi comma x x x minus kga times w comma x x minus psi comma x. And that is equal to zero. We're up to number 42. Okay, then I'm gonna take equation 38, and I'm gonna solve 38 in terms of psi comma x. Notice that if I solve for psi comma x, I can write that explicitly in terms of w and its derivatives. In this case, w double dot and w comma x x. So rewriting equation 38, I get psi comma x is equal to f minus mw double dot plus kga w comma xx, all divided by kga, number 43. Now, if we look at equation 42, in terms of psi, it requires a psi comma x, which is exactly what we have here. It also requires a psi comma x, the second time derivative of psi comma x, and it also requires a second x derivative of psi comma x. 
Let me show you mathematically what I'm talking about. So I can take equation 43, and using that I can easily get an expression for psi comma x x x. I'm not going to do it, I'll leave that to you. But fundamentally I can get an expression by taking the right hand side of equation 43 and differentiating that twice with respect to x. Similarly, I can take psi comma x and differentiate it twice with respect to time because I'm going to need that for this first term. So psi comma x double dot is equal to, again, the right hand side of 43 dot dot. I'll give these numbers 44 and 5. All right, so now if I take 43, 4, and 5, and I substitute that in here into this equation, I can arrive at an equation purely in terms of w and its derivatives. Let me just write it out for you. All this is is a little bit of algebra. If you guys feel like you need to do it for a homework problem, be my guest. But this is the answer that you should arrive at, and it's a fairly well-known answer. 43, 44, and 45 are substituted into 42, and we get the following expression. E i w comma x x x x, fourth derivative with respect to x, plus m w double dot, minus j times 1 plus e over k g times w comma x x dot dot, plus rho j over k g times w dot 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 dot, the fourth time derivative is equal to f plus j over kga times f double dot minus ei over kga f comma xx. Number 46 and a big red box around that. That is it. We are done. I remind you that rho a is equal to m and that rho i is equal to j. Okay, but notice that we have an equation only in terms of w. w is the only unknown in this equation, and so we can solve this using standard techniques. What are standard techniques? Well, we first solve the free vibration problem by setting the right-hand side equal to zero. Then we can assume harmonic motion, and we can come up with the mode shapes. And by the way, I could similarly have come up with an equation only in terms of psi as well. But since we want to find the displacement of the beam, W tends to be the more interesting variable to solve for, certainly the one to solve for first. Okay, so this is the equation of motion again for a uniform Timoshenko beam. As the shear modulus approaches infinity, we notice these two terms on the right-hand side would cancel out, this term on the left-hand side would cancel out, and then this part would disappear of that term. And what we left with is the equation for an Euler-Bernoulli beam. E i w comma x x plus m w double dot is equal to f, and the only extra term is this here, the minus j w comma x x double dot. This is the term due to the rotatory kinetic energy, which in the case of an Euler Bernoulli beam was neglected. Okay, so what does this mean? As the shear modulus approaches infinity, so we get the Euler-Bernoulli equation. The Timoshenko beam approaches the Euler-Bernoulli beam because as the shear modulus gets infinitely large, the beam is unable to shear anymore. And if one reads between the lines in all of this, one should understand that a Timoshenko beam is actually less stiff than an Euler-Bernoulli beam, right? In other words, an Euler-Bernoulli beam is like a Timoshenko beam that's infinitely stiff in shear. So, a Timoshenko beam is less stiff or more compliant, which means for a given loading condition, a Timoshenko beam should deflect more than an Euler Bernoulli beam. It's less stiff. And so, just like that, we are done with this video and with the series. But before we go, I'd like to take it from the top real quick, just one time, so that we can just see the concepts that we talked about here without getting bogged down by any mathematics. So we started with four assumptions, the homogeneous isotropic beam, that cross sections move vertically due to the shear but do not rotate, that the line segments that are horizontal and tangent to the center line, those are the ones that are rotated, and they're rotated by the shear angle, and then finally that shear is uniform across the cross section. Equation one is the foundation of everything we did. We said that the angle or the slope of the center line of the beam is equal to the angle due to the shear rotation plus the angle due to the bending rotation. As a result of our models, we could then come up with a displacement field, 
Most importantly, we notice that displacement in the U direction was a function of bending only. This because of our assumption that shear causes no rotation of the cross sections. From the displacement field, we were able to get our strains, and we added a shear correction factor to account for the assumption that strain is constant across the cross section of the beam, which it isn't. Then a table to show for various geometries how we can correct for the constant shear assumption. And then we get to Hamilton's principle where we start off by calculating the strain energy using the strains we calculated a few pages before. We simplified our expression of the strain energy, took the variation of that, integrated it by parts in order to get it into its strong form, and this is the final form we got it into to use in Hamilton's principle. For the kinetic energy, we drew on work we had done in a previous video, the only difference here is we recognize that due to our definition of shear, that it was only the change in bending angle that contributed to the rotational kinetic energy. I should mention that kinetic energy was something that was omitted in the case of the Euler-Bernoulli beam, but was found to be important for the case of a Timoshenko beam. Took the variation of that, we integrated by parts, got it into its strong form, and then proceeded with finding the external work and the variation of that. We substituted all of these into Hamilton's principle. We got our equations of motions in the most general form. I derived expressions for the moment and for the shear force. And using that showed that the equations of motion could be rewritten in terms of the shear force and moment, along with the corresponding boundary conditions. And then finally, we went ahead and we made the assumption of a uniform beam and simplified the equations of motion and the boundary conditions accordingly. And then the last thing I did is I showed how you could take the two equations of motion and combine them to eliminate psi and write it in terms of a single equation of motion, which was dependent only on W and its derivatives. I also explained that a Timoshenko beam is actually less stiff than an Euler-Bernoulli beam. And in the limit as the shear stiffness of the Timoshenko beam goes to infinity, these equations of motion reduced to those of an Euler-Bernoulli beam. Anyway, that's it. That's all I have to say about this video. I'm sure if you made it this far, you found something interesting in it. Please go ahead and help me out and smash those like buttons. I'd really appreciate it. Or better still, click on the subscribe link below and click on the bell icon. That way you'll be notified of future video releases. The notes from this video, as always, are downloadable from the link in the video description below. If you have any questions, compliments, criticisms, advice, please let me know in the comment section below. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.